Good day and welcome to Navin Florin International Limited Q2 and H1 FY24 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Bhavya Shah from Orient Capital. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you and welcome to the Q2 and H1 FI24 earnings conference call. Today on this call, we have Mr. Vishad Mafatlal, Chairman, Mr. Radish Welling, Managing Director, and Mr. Anish Ganatra, Chief Financial Officer of Navin Florin International Limited. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company, which are based on beliefs, opinion, and expectations as of today. Actual results may differ materially. These statements are not the guarantees of future performance and involve risk and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. A detailed safe harbor statement is given on page number two of investor presentation of the company, which has been uploaded on the stock exchange and company's website. With this, I now hand over the call to Mr. Vishad Mafatlan for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to Q2 and H1 Financial 24 years earning call. As we delve into the financial and operational performance of the half year gone by, I'd like to emphasize that our unwavering commitment remains firmly rooted in delivering the utmost value to our stakeholders. Over the past few months, we have intensified our focus on enhancing customer interactions and forging stronger partnerships, initiatives that have already yielded positive results. As we navigate the complex landscape of our industry, my priorities to the team remain crystal clear. Paramount importance is placed on safety and well-being of our workforce and the operational resilience of our facilities. While continuing to drive efficiency across the organization, we are steadfastly building a robust and diverse business pipeline that positions us for sustainable growth and success in the future. Our focus is to improve the quality of revenues that is more predictable, diverse, and preferably backed by multi-year supply contracts. The trust and support from our customers will make our business more resilient and sustainable. We will continue our focus on growth within a strong financial framework, including management of working capital and cash flows. We are currently working on multiple new projects, which will translate into new CapEx programs and new growth opportunities for Naveen Flory. We will take these projects to our board for approval as we complete technical, commercial, and financial due diligence. I am currently spending my time and shall continue to do so in meeting with CEOs and senior leadership teams of all key global customers across the three business units. Our founder, late Sri Arvind Bhai, foresaw that Naveen Florine to succeed across market cycles, trust and inclusion would need to be more than attributes. They remain the pillars of Naveen Florine's ecosystem. I am pleased to announce that in commemoration of the centenary birth year of our esteemed founder, Sri Arvind Bhai Mahatlan, the board has approved a one-time special dividend of 3 rupees a share, in addition to an interim dividend of rupees 5 per share. This momentous occasion provides us with a unique opportunity to honor the visionary leader whose dedication and passion laid the foundation for our success. Our founder's unwavering commitment to excellence has guided us through a century of growth and achievement. And this special dividend reflects our gratitude to our shareholders who have supported us on this remarkable journey. We look forward to continuing our founder's legacy of innovation and leadership in the years to come. With this, now I hand over the call to Radesh and Anish to provide an update on the operational and financial performance. Good evening, and thank you for attending the earnings call. The revenues and profitability in the quarter Q2 FY24 were below our expectations. Though our order books across businesses remained strong, our actual production was lower than our planned. Let me take you through business-wise performance for the quarter. 
Our specialty business performance was impacted due to deferment of sales of two products from Q2 to Q3 due to certain production related issues in the age. On the positive side, we are expected to launch two new molecules from our DH plant and three new molecules from Surat facility in the coming quarter. We are confident with the strong partnership and technology platform will continue to deliver innovative offerings to our customers. This business will continue to remain a high growth business for us in the future as well. CapEx of 30 crore towards development of a completely new capability in Surat is on track and is expected to generate revenue from FY25. Agro specialty capex in the H is also progressing well and is estimated to commission at the end of this financial year. We have already secured PO covering the dedicated portion of the capacity for calendar year 24. This will contribute significantly to growth in revenues and specialty starting next year. Our HPP business was impacted due to unexpected breakdown in the plant during June, July at the H. The plant is now operational and is progressively ramping up. We are also working with our partners to further improve and enhance productivity and reliability of the plant. We commissioned our R32 plant in past quarter and stabilized the production by middle of September. This plant is now operational and our order book remains robust. We expect the plant to be running to optimal capacity going forward and we expect to generate sizable revenues in the plant from next quarter onwards. Demand for R22, especially in international markets, was muted. And we expect demand to start picking up from end January onwards. For the non-MSF R22, which is primarily used in pharmaceuticals and agrochemicals segment, the demand continues to remain strong. Our AHS project for adding 40,000 metric tons of hydrofluoric acid capacity in the H is progressing well and is as per schedule. Our CDMO business revenues in the last quarter were all from new molecules. We see this as a positive sign as our overall product basket in CDMO expands. Detail engineering of CGMP is as per schedule. In this business, we had to defer significant sales of one campaign from Q2 to Q3 due to last minute change made by the customer in product specification and the method of analysis. At recently held CPHI in Europe, we launched our new brand, Naveen Molecular, for our CDMO business. Naveen Molecular will help us further sharpen our value proposition to offer a wide ranging CDMO services to our customer support, supporting projects, including non floro projects, through the clinical phases to commercial manufacturing. Going forward, all our CDMO business for global pharma innovators will be done under Naveen Molecular brand. I'll now hand over the line to our CFO, Mr. Anish Ganatra, to give you a brief on the financial performance of the company. Thank you very much. Thank you, Radesh. Good evening to all the participants. Let me brief you on the overall financial performance of the company. Sales during the quarter were impacted largely due to slower stabilization of R32 plant. Uh, the progressive ramping up of H HPP plant at the H post the June-July shutdown. Sales of a campaign in CDMO deferred to Q3 FY24 due to change in product specification and method of analysis. Production-related issues in the H resulted in the referral of sales of two new products and speciality. The overall revenue impact of these uh, contributing factors is about 90 to 100 crores. Adjusting for these factors, our revenue would have been in the range of 550 to 570 crore for the quarter. EBITDA margins were therefore impacted by lower operating uh, leverage and we also had one-off costs of approximately 6 crores due to some corrective measures taken at the H plant. I will now share the highlights of our performance for Q2 FY24 and first half FY24, post which we will be happy to take questions from all of you. For first half FY24, on a consolidated basis, the company reported revenue from operations of Rs 963 crores 
as against rupees 817 crores in H1 FY23, a growth of 18% year on year. Operating with it does to that rupees 213 crores as against rupees 193 crores in H1 FY24, up by 10%. Operating EBITDA margin stood at 22.1% as against 23.6% in H1 FY23, lower by 155 basis points. Operating PBT at Rs. 128 crores for H1 FY24 as against Rs. 159 crores in H1 FY23 was lower by 20%. Uh, profit after tax stood at Rs. 122 crores for the first half of the year as against Rs. 132 crores in, in H1 FY24, reflecting higher depreciation and uh, finance costs associated with the head assets apart from lost sales. Now coming to the quarterly performance for Q2 FY24. Company reported growth of 13% in net revenue from operations to 472 crores against rupees 419 crores in Q2 FY23. Operating margin was 98 crores as against 94 crores in Q2 FY23, a growth of 5% year on year, and EBITDA margin stood at 20.8% for Q2 FY24. Operating PBT stood at Rs. 54 crores, lower by 25% as compared to the same period last year. PAT stood at 61 crores for Q2 FY24 as against 58 crores in, in Q2 FY23. Net debt at the end of Q2 FY24 stood at about 780 crores. A net debt to equity ratio at the end of Q2 FY24 was about 0.34. Our focused efforts to reduce working capital has helped release about 275 crores uh, during, of cash during first half FY24. We have progressively brought down inventory, accelerated the collection of receivables, and continue to work on extending credit terms with our suppliers. Our cash conversion cycle at the end of H1 FY24 was about 90 days compared to about 135 days at the end of FY23. So that is it from my side. We'll now open the floor for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star in two. Participants are requested to use only handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We take the first question from the line of Mr. Rohit Nagaraj from Centrum Broking. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so first question is on the uh, CDMO front. Uh, so uh, we had indicated last year that uh, we have a target uh, to reach about $100 million by sometimes 26, 27. Uh, so how do we uh, see the progress going ahead? And what could be the milestones to achieve those 100, that 100 million target? I mean, will it be a step jump or will it be a gradual increase? Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, as far as the target is concerned, uh, we're working towards that right now. Uh, it will not a step jump. So it will not be, a, you know, that one year we've actually done significantly lower than that and the following year we suddenly achieve 100. It will be a gradual move towards that. At the same time, the business, as we have indicated before as well, will continue to remain lumpy. That's just the nature of the business. Uh, as you all know, uh, about two years back, we started focusing specifically on identifying and developing more late-stage opportunities. And we are actually seeing a lot of success in that particular area. 
And that is what is giving us additional confidence now that we should be able to directionally achieve that number uh, around the year that you mentioned. It will be difficult for us to specifically project if it will be in one year or other, but directionally we should be able to achieve that given the strength of our pipeline, the way we are looking at it. Got it. Uh, so my second question is on Honeywell. So uh, we had indicated prior that uh, we will be uh, speaking with Honeywell during 2023 for any new opportunities as well as uh, the expansion or doubling capacity for uh, the uh, current uh, Honeywell product. Uh, any uh, new update on the same and uh, are there any positive indications from Honeywell to uh, give us newer projects over the next uh, foreseeable future? Thank you. Yeah, currently there are a uh, few things that we are discussing. Our engagement uh, is quite deep-rooted with Honeywell. There are few things that we are discussing, but these are basically ongoing discussions. And uh, uh, as we have indicated earlier, our initial focus, especially for this year, has to be to stabilize the plan that we have invested in and to ensure that that starts running to the full capacity. And while we do that, we've identified a few projects to work with them on, and those discussions, uh, both on the technology side uh, as well as on the commercial side, are ongoing. Uh, just one clarification, uh, when are we expecting to reach optimal utilization on the existing plant for the uh, recent uh, issue? Uh, I think we are, you know, since we had this issue in June, July, we are progressively ramping uh, the production uh, volume that we are manufacturing uh, from that particular plant. Uh, it will be difficult to give a specific target, but we are actually moving positively. For example, in Q3, our production will be more than what we did in Q2. In Q2, our production was more than what we did in Q1. It will be difficult to say as to when we will achieve uh, the full capacity, etc., but we are actually moving in the right direction. What we don't want to do is suddenly move it to full capacity and then again get into some issues. So uh, we are actually progressively ramping that up. And as we are doing that, we are also closely uh, interacting with uh, Honeywell to further identify and develop opportunities for enhancing productivity as well as reliability of the plant. Sure. Uh, thanks for answering the questions and best of luck, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Mr. Sadarshan Padmanaman from JM Financial. PMS, please go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, sir, uh, I mean, uh, just taking your earlier commentary, introductory commentary about, you know, the aspiration of following more longer term contracts, uh, what is if you can give a little bit more, you know, clarity with respect to, you know, if one is looking at the business, the long term contract gives stability, but no versatility in the sense that, you know, between moving one, you know, such, you know a type of molecule manufacturing to another. So, in your opinion, you know, how much of, you know, the sale, say two, three years down the line, would be. Sorry, we lost you. No, sorry, we lost you. Uh, we just heard the starting of that question, then after that, we lost you. Uh, my question is more on understanding on the long-term contracts aspiration. So we have seen a few long-term contracts getting signed, you know, but over a period of time, how much of revenues or scale do you expect, uh, you know, or do you want from a long-term contract? Because it is also sacrificing, you know, stability for versatility. So one, on that strategy, what is your thought process? The second is on the business perspective, I'm not looking at a segment. But as a whole, we are seeing Agri specifically going through a lot more pain. So do we have enough engines on the non-Agri side? I'm talking about, say, pharmaceuticals and the, you know, others. To offset the impact, at least in the near term, for any weakness it's on the Agri side. So I think, uh, as we have indicated before as well, our focus will continue to remain to ensure that our overall business is very diversified as well as very balanced. Uh, what I mean by that is that we will continue to focus on businesses 
uh, which are backed by long term contracts and then invest in dedicated plans for specific customer for specific products we will also have investments done in mpps which will make molecules for multiple customers and multiple product uh, multiple segments and that is the model we will continue to have uh, as i have indicated before if you look at the cdmo business it's a pure service business uh, hpp it's more of a pure product business there will be some uh, outliers like the honeywell project etc but though that will be more of a product driven business whereas specialty will be a combination of both and that that is how we actually look at continuing that uh, again on the agri point as you know our business is quite diversified we don't have any agri on the cdmo side we don't have any any agri on the H, hpp side apart from the small volume of r22 that goes uh, into agrochemicals whatever agri business we do is primarily in specialty and there also as you know we have actually started focusing since last year on performance material where we are actually seeing pretty significant traction again within agri uh, as uh, you have seen from our results in q1 and also the commentary that anish provided earlier with respect to q2 we are actually not seeing uh, as much uh, demand dip in the demand as some of the other players are seeing even from agri that is primarily because of the balance that we have between the generic molecules and the newer molecules and newer demand for our newer molecules continue to remain very robust on generic molecules especially the older ones which we were supplying out of surat yes we have seen certain softness in the demand so that is the strategy that we have had and that's the strategy we will continue to be on one last thing before i wind back is you know we would continue to go ahead with our capex i mean because the demand continues to remain strong so there'll be no change in the capex which we have earlier i you know uh, outlined barring that you know probably the agrochemicals is deferred by quarter or so no as our chairman indicated in his opening remarks we are currently evaluating a few projects but each of the project will be evaluated on its own merit and as in when the operating team first of all needs to be very confident on the merit of the project it should qualify and meet our criteria both the strategic criteria uh, as well as financial criteria as it does then the operating team will present it to the chairman and once chairman approves it we will take it to the board so nothing changes on that so sure. thank you for joining us Thank you, sir. The next question is from the line of Krishnan Parwani from Jain Finance. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Uh, uh, just, just a uh, uh, couple of clarifications. So, first on the debtor days, um, your debtor days have come down by thirty odd days. Um, is there any particular reason, and should we take this as a norm going forward? So, uh, thanks, Krishnan and Samish here. Uh, on the debtor day is i mean you're right I and mean, it has come down and part of it is got to do with how we are changing our approach towards collection um, you know we are focused on ensuring that the collection happen on a uh, you know the, the credit terms are 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 tighter you know in, in the sense that we do not want extended credit we are also using innovative programs on on vendor financing and customer financing to ensure that the receivables are received because both are focused on working capital and cash flow is no longer transactional it's more strategic in nature so to answer your question on whether this is a norm to consider i would indicate at this stage while we continue to work on improving this but at this stage i would not give any further guidance beyond the 90 days which i had held even in uh, the last year that i had mentioned on the uh, commentary to our fy23 that we would target to hit the 90 days uh, cash conversion cycle okay noted uh, yeah. secondly um, uh, on the hpp side um, uh, just wanted to check would we be able to let's say recover the lost volumes of hpp in the second half is there a possibility so uh, most of that volume that we were we had to supply earlier we will recover the i think the real question is 
will that be incremental on top of what you would have otherwise delivered in the following quarter? That is really difficult uh, 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 to really ascertain because as you know, all of that is single product, single customer. So ultimately the question is what is the total requirement that the customer has? Currently, if you see, we are limited by the volume that we are producing and not by the demand that we are seeing from our customer. Noted. Uh, fair point. And the last bit is on the uh, borrowing front. So our uh, gross borrowings uh, or gross debt has uh, is is more than 1200 crore now. So just wanted to check what is the comfortable level according to you? That's my last question. So again, uh, if you look at our net debt position, which is the way you should look at in the borrowing sense, it's still 780 crores as I mentioned in my commentary. And that as an net debt to equity ratio of 0.34 is, uh, is very comfortable for us. So we will, um, you know, we don't give guidance on this, but essentially you can see that we are a very strong balance sheet at the moment with a solid sort of cash in hand position as well as a comfortable net debt position. Uh, yes, uh, uh, no doubt about your uh, credibility. Uh, uh, amazing. Uh, thank you so much for uh, patiently answering my questions and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all the participants in the conference, please limit your question to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we would request you to rejoin the question queue. We take the next question from the line of Abhijit from Kodak Securities. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, good evening. Thanks. Thanks for taking my question. Um, just on the specialty chemicals business, uh, with regard to this, uh, you know, these production-related issues that you've highlighted, uh, could you please share some more color about, you know, what exactly uh, these uh, these are about, and uh, does this impact the uh, ramp-up time frame that we had in mind for this? for the multi-purpose plant, uh, you know, when we originally envisaged the project. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't want to get into too much technical details, uh, but both of these uh, are new molecules. One which we had earlier done in Surat in very, at very small volume, and we were actually doing the commercial production in NPP. And the other one is was a completely new molecule that we were doing for the first time in NPP. Uh, we have since resolved the issue, uh, and uh, the production has uh, actually started for both the molecules. Uh, the total quantum of that was approximately 34 crore between the two molecules, and uh, that sales is actually will be differing from Q2 to Q3. So both the molecules, the sales of both these will actually happen in Q3. But this is primarily from NPP in the head, and both of these are new molecules. Right, uh, and uh, you know, with regard to the ramp up time frame that we had in mind for this uh, project, does that sort of remain on track? Uh, you're specifically talking about NPP or which project you're talking about? Uh, for the multi-purpose plant. Yeah, multi-purpose, you know that we earlier when we uh, presented the original plan, uh, it was based on four molecules. Uh, we've actually seen the demand softness on one of them, uh, which is the agri product, uh, and hence we have actually moved very quickly to bring in other new opportunities and uh, put them in uh, NPP. And uh, you know that is why you are seeing these two new molecules coming, where we have quickly done the development, quickly qualification from pilot facility, and now we have actually uh, uh, doing the commercial production in NPP. But we expect that overall directionally it will continue as per the original expectation. It's quite possible that in one molecule the expectation might be lower than ex uh, over the lower than the original expectation. In some other molecules, uh, it could be higher than the original expectation. But that's just the nature of NPP. Got it. Thank you. And just one last thing from my side uh, with regard to the uh, uh, you know. Six, uh, 540 crore project, agro project at the Hayes that's going to be commissioned by the end of this financial year. 
uh, uh, what percentage of the output is tied up already under the dedicated commitment and uh, what sort of time frame should we expect for full uh, ramp up of that project so as you uh, you might remember that 50% of that production uh, was actually covered under a long term contract and the other 50% we had kept it open to take advantage of the spot pricing and also there also we had actually started talking to the customers to possibly cover some of the volume but that will only happen once the production starts so that 50% that we talked about earlier we have already received the pos for that for for uh, 2024 So that fifty percent is already covered. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to add a bit on that one. Uh, you know what? What Rajesh rightly mentioned: fifty percent of our uh, dedicated capacity is being covered out. Um, it's still in line with the plan, and you know the idea was to ramp it up and achieve PAR in about two years after commissioning. So it doesn't change in in, in that sense. Just good. Thank you so much, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is from the line of Mr. Madhav Marda from Fidelity. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, my first question was, um, you know, the deferral that we are seeing in Q2 across uh, uh, a lot of our sub segments. Uh, if I if I were to look at, you know, because if it's a deferral, it just goes to Q3 or Q4, for example. um is it fair to assume that the revenue that we had planned for fy24 as a whole that doesn't uh, change because of the deferral or can we be capacity constrained because some of our original q2 production now happening in q3 and then that creates a challenge uh, just wanted to get your thoughts in yeah i think uh, it will be really difficult to talk about it on an annualized basis because we still trying to get handle on the q4 but specifically with related to q2 to q3 uh, most of the sales will actually move to q3 but the only question is that will all of that be incremental over and above what we would have otherwise done in q3 that uh, to answer that question we will have to look at it on a bill to bill basis uh, i earlier talked about on the speciality on the cdmo it's about 18 crore as was indicated earlier that will be an incremental revenue will come in q3 but on the other businesses uh, for example r32 we lost some because the product uh, the the plan stabilization took a little longer than we uh, expected so those business, uh, so that approximately about 20 crore worth of sales will actually happen in q3 now uh, and now the plant is actually running to optimal capacity uh, so that will get covered in in uh, q3 so some of that volume will actually be uh, incremental uh but uh, some of that will as you rightly mentioned will get constrained because of the overall capacity uh that we have available as as i mentioned earlier on the uh, uh honeywell project volume which is one that there uh, you know the constraint is primarily on the capacity side so on some of it it will be incremental on some of it we will be constrained by the capacity got it understood and then just on the uh, uh, the r32 plant uh So, like you mentioned, that the order book is robust, and that's great to know. Uh, like, are we selling most of it in the domestic market or exports? And uh, uh, you know, are we like tying in some of the R32 volumes for CY24 uh, with specific customers, or this will be sold completely on a spot basis? If you could help us understand that, that would be very helpful. Approximately 50-50 percent, 50 percent export, 50 percent domestic, and uh, we are currently in discussion with uh, two customers. for potentially tying up for 2024 volume and we are actually having uh, pretty good discussions with both of them our intention is to at least lock with one of them uh, in the next few weeks and uh, this should be uh, customer at the export market or in the domestic market? yes it should be exports right? yes yes exports exports got it okay thank you Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vivek Rajamani from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead, sir. Um, hi, sir. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, uh, sorry, so if this is a bit repetitive, but uh, on the CDMO side, given that you've seen uh, two large molecules being pushed out to CY24, uh, could you 
uh, maybe help us uh, or you know give a sense of you know how we should think about the revenue growth for this segment in F24 and F25? Uh, that was the first question. Now it's going to be very difficult uh, for us to you know give that because we are still in conversation with the customers to understand what their requirement for calendar year 24 is. is. Uh, we know that they have actually told us that we will continue to supply then these molecules for the next campaign, and the next campaign is basically move to 24. The answer yet from the customer in terms of uh, exactly what the volume required for these campaigns is going to be. So it is, it is little, uh, I would say, little early. We probably might have better idea on what the calendar year 24 numbers look like, probably by in uh, December, beginning January. I'm sure, sir. So. I completely understand. And the second question was, uh, obviously, because of the challenges uh, in this quarter, uh, your EBITDA margin put at about 21%. Uh, could you maybe just give us a sense of the glide path that we should assume for these margins to go back to a bit more normal levels? How do we think about that over the next two quarters or maybe even into next year? Thank you very much. I think, uh, let me give some color and then Anish will uh, See, if you actually look at, uh, I'm, I'm sure you heard Anish's opening commentary. He basically talked about some sales that we unfortunately lost uh, because of supply side constraint in Q2. Uh, if we had actually done those sales, because all the costs, especially the fixed cost related to those sales were already, those were already reflected in our p &L our EBITDA margin would have been significantly higher than uh, what it was. Directionally, uh, we have always said that uh, our focus would be continue to actually, uh, uh, if you, especially if you look at the new projects that we are undertaking, to continuously improve our overall margin profile. There could be quarters when it will be slightly down. There could be quarters when there will be slightly up. But specifically in this quarter, the, the impact that was seen was primarily because of the operational leverage that we actually didn't have because of the sales that was lost. Nothing to add. I think we covered it. Sure, sir. Very clear. Thank you so much and all the very best. A reminder to all the participants, please limit your question to two per participant. We take the next question from the line of Mr. Sanjay Chen from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, sir. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, sorry, I'm starting with the bookkeeping one. Uh, can you help us understand what is the capacity utilization for all the three plants, which is uh, Honeywell, MPP, and uh, dedicated agro for this quarter? We have not given out capacity utilization numbers, uh, and uh, you know I don't think it will be appropriate for us to do that because a lot of that information is confidential. Correct. Got it. No, this is was just for modeling to tell how the progression will happen for each of this plant, uh, but that's fine. Uh, but a follow-up to that, Radish, actually in, in your uh, previous call, you mentioned that the Anivel plant has reached the optimal utilization. Uh, post the uh, recommissioning, uh, have we again got into a problem to now come back and uh, uh, look at more gradual uh, than reaching again an optimal utilization? No. Uh, if you see, after the shutdown that we had in July, uh, June and July, we are progressively ramping up the capacity. And so as I mentioned earlier, our Q2 production was higher than the production in Q1, obviously, because of the shutdown. Our Q3 production is expected to be higher than Q2 production. So we are progressively ramping it up. Got it. And on the, uh, uh, if I look at speciality, that is of the export market, which will uh, largely cover uh, our uh, new new progression, what, what we were making. Uh, it appears to be uh, quite soft, a dip of 40%. And if I take out the 20 crores also, uh, what we are talking of supplying in it in the next quarter, uh, it comes to 110. And this is versus 150 in the last quarter. Now, uh, where are we seeing this uh, difference of 40 crore uh, on a sequential basis? 
So, uh, Sanjesh, I think you're referring to the uh, split between domestic and exports in the yes. specialty business, correct? Correct, correct, sir. Yeah, so, so over there are a large uh, one of the molecules uh, which we uh, traditionally export and in the future will continue to export as well, but on the request of customer that was supplied domestically to another um, uh, one of their suppliers, you know, and for making another product. So that that was about 40 crores. So roughly, if you kind of look at that, that would change the mix. You know, that would have normally gone as an export, but actually went as a domestic supply because of a request from the end customer itself, you know. Then it tells with the domestic in a sense as half quarter and quarter in that sense. Because the domestic has only grown 16 crores quarter on quarter. If I remove that 40 crores, that means there is a 25% uh, sequential fall in speciality. Uh, I presume pharma has been doing well. Uh, 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 performance has been doing well. Is that uh, domestic, the export agro, uh, sorry, uh, so what, what are we missing in the domestic? In so in the uh, pharma world where we had the supplies to pharma agri generics, uh, I think there were two molecules last year which we have not really had any, uh, the demand there is not being, uh, has been very weak, and that that hasn't really materialized in the domestic. But that's two molecules. I don't know what number you're looking at, but in our sense, that was more like about 15 odd crores. So we lost 15 odd crores of revenue from those two molecules in the domestic. Yes, product. yes, that's right, that's right. And that's largely related to, I think it's um, you know over there you can look at. I think it's supplied to the ARV sector in in pharma. Got it. Uh, one last question, sorry, and pressing it one more. Uh, on the CDMO side, uh, Radesh, you mentioned that most of the revenue has come from the new molecule. Um, why the old molecule or the retreat or it's just a lumpiness? Are we uh, cautiously focused on developing more molecules? Can you give more color on that side? No, I don't think it is. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't think we can really influence that process. Especially on a quarter to quarter basis, is really difficult because typically what happens is on the repeat orders, as we have mentioned before, our customers tend to actually uh, operate on a very ca on a campaign basis, and a lot of these uh, customers, especially for molecules which are scaling up, they typically take a campaign once in uh, in a two years, etc. So this is not something that we can directly influence. Uh, you know, we consciously try to expand our customer basket, uh, expand the basket of new molecules, uh, uh, as well as the opportunity that I earlier talked about, which is basically identifying and developing late stage molecules. But the, uh, the you know the, the timeline as to when we receive the POs for the repeat orders is very very difficult for us to influence. So what we tell you is not by design, uh, it, it, it has come by coincidence and, uh, and and that's healthy for our future opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Correct. Got it. And, Got it. and uh, just one thing on the speciality, uh, you know most of our business today is coming from agro. You know the performance material is actually doing quite well, but the overall impact as a percentage of sales is still limited. And as you know, in agro, what we really supply is an intermediate, which typically goes to one of the AI manufacturers. So though the customers typically remain the same, the consumers can change. Sometimes they might send to a tech, the manufacturer of the technical grade in India. Sometimes they send ask us to send it to a manufacturer of a technical grade overseas. Sometimes they ask us to send it to their own manufacturing plant in US or Europe. So I think it will be a little difficult for us uh, uh, to look at, you know, or, or compare the export versus uh, domestic mix in, in our speciality. Of course, in HPP and CDMO, you can, but in, in speciality, it becomes a little tricky. No, that's clear, Rajesh. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, uh, these are from my side. Uh, best of luck for the coming quarter. Thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please limit your question to two per participant. 
The next question is from the line of Siddharth Gadekar from Equity Securities. Please go ahead, sir. Oh, hi, sir. So, first question is on the HFO debottlenecking. We were supposed to announce the project somewhere in between the second and the third quarter. So, where are we on that those timelines? And the second question is on the CGMP4 plant. Uh, when can we expect the announcement for the CGMP4 plant? No, I think it's going to be difficult for us to give specific timeline. Both these projects are currently in the pipeline. The discussions are going on. Uh, we're currently in the process of uh, having some of the commercial discussions, especially on the uh, Honeywell D bottle making. Uh, but it will be very difficult for us to give a specific timeline on either of these two projects. Okay, sir, so got it. Mr. Siddharth, does that answer your question, sir? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We'll take the next question from the line of Isha from VT Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Good evening, sir. So, my first question is related to specialty chemicals. Last, uh, two quarters back, we had mentioned of one of the molecules which saw the, where the demand was pretty low. But somehow the margin was, uh, it's a very high margin molecule. So any update on that? Are we seeing uh, uh, demand recovery or anything from the customer? Are we hearing? Yeah, that was an agri molecule I think you are referring to. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, which we were supplying from uh, Surat. We have actually, uh, you know, didn't have much of the demand in the first half. The, uh, the demand has again come back. We will be supplying... Uh, we've supplied some molecule in this particular quarter and we will continue to supply in the coming quarter. But the good news is that we have actually received pretty good forecast for the following year for that molecule. Okay. And, uh, sir, another question is related to CDMO. Last quarter, we uh, you had mentioned about uh, fermion agreement. So, basically, that particular agreement has three molecules. So, one or the, uh, the sample was given and the rest two molecules were under process. So, can you please update me on that? No, that process is ongoing, uh, you know, and I think uh, some of the work that we are doing there, uh, you know, on these molecules also forms the basis for our CGMP4. So, uh, the work is going on there. It will be difficult for us to give, you know, quarter-on-quarter quarter update on, on each of the molecules. Uh, but uh, I think it's safe to assume that, uh, uh, you know, we are all eager to move this, to progress this opportunity with this customer forward uh, because this actually uh, uh, forms a significant basis of our CGMP4 as well because these are all commercial or close to commercial molecules. So, sir, is my understanding correct that the supply Sorry, cannot be? Sir, may we request to join the question queue, ma'am? We have several thank participants you. waiting for the Okay. Question. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll take the next question from the line of Jason. <laughs> Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, hello. Thanks. Thanks for taking my question, sir. Uh, so, uh, one of my questions was uh, in terms of specialty chemicals. So what percentage of an intermediate as we are supplying intermediates, as you said, especially to the agrochem side, what percentage of the intermediates goes into patented or, or generic products? Uh, is, is, can a ballpark be given for that, uh, uh, for that number? I think the way we look at our business is whatever we do has to be differentiated, where we have a clear differentiated value proposition. As you know, when we started our business and we were building up the business, a lot of it was going into generic molecules. A lot of the new opportunities that we have are primarily into the new molecules. It will be difficult for us to give on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis split between generic uh, and uh, uh, and uh, patented molecules. Sure, sir. And sir, just to follow up to that, I wanted to wanted to know is, of course, you are talking about you know being differentiated and completely understand that's higher up the value chain, and it's it's sync with your uh, value proposition and your aim to be higher up the value chain. But just would want to understand, you know, uh, for example, in the CDMO businesses, certain business gets deferred, and of course, patented or high value business will be tougher to crack. And in terms of generic, probably when you're looking at balancing demand in terms of capacity utilization for your plants as well. 
Uh, how do you see that balance play out in terms of your aim to uh, go higher up the value chain? No, so uh, see, even when you are talking about hmm. uh, generic molecules, these are not, uh, uh, you know, typically even those generic molecules, if you see our sales profile, hmm. we are all selling it to innovator companies. Right. So you don't see us actually selling any of them. If you see, none of our generic molecules are actually going to generic companies. Okay, so uh, okay. I think the value that we deliver or the value that our customers see remains the same across this one. Because ultimately we are supplying to the same uh, innovator company. Sure, sure. sure. So, and one final question from my side, sir. Uh, you know, a lot of our spectrum business will be contracted. And uh, we clearly know that, you know, China in the past six months, they are driving down prices of intermediates. Uh, especially in the ACM side. So just wanted to know any structural changes in your contracts. There might be some de-escalation clauses, uh, certain uh, certain criteria like that. In the face of such intense competition coming from China, any any structural changes to those contracts? Uh, just your, your any color on that? Uh, I think these are you know ongoing discussions that we have. Uh, and this is actually not true only for Agri, by the way. It's basically across the businesses, you know, across the segments, this is the same phenomena that is playing on. Uh, there are always these conversations going on uh, in terms of how do we actually work with all these key customers that we have to ensure that there is a win-win scenario. Uh, so, you know, so that, that's just ongoing conversations that we typically continue to have. If I may add, Jason, you know, our, yes, our sort of... Uh, relationship with the customers is, is strategic in nature. It's not transactional. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you know, um, one, there is, uh, you know, if, if there are conversations like that going on, they are more problem solving and opportunity creation rather than anything else. So sure. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for answering the question. So thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please limit your question to two participants. We we'll take the next question from the line of Neet Hora from MK Global Financial Services. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, uh, so sorry for hopping on this again. Uh, with respect to the new dedicated agro key phase that we are doing, uh, we now estimate that the commissioning will be by end of FY24 instead of December 23. Uh, so if we can get some color on the reason for this slight delay, that would be helpful. Uh, and secondly, we have mentioned that uh, we have received POs for uh, dedicated portion of the capacity for CY24. Uh, so just on thought, uh, just your thought on you know how does this arrangement work with the customer? Is it more contractual in nature in terms of volume tires, or is it more driven by annual purchase orders that the customer sends? Uh, meaning you know, uh, are we tied up also for CY25, 26 uh, for this with the customer? And lastly, uh, you know, your thought on uh, how do you see the non-dedicated portion of the demand shaping up uh, for this plan? Yeah, so uh, uh, as far as, uh, uh, as we have mentioned, uh, almost 50% of that particular project is underlined by uh, one particular customer. Uh, as we are going into 2024, we have received confirmed purchase orders for the volume that will be supplied from 24, and that process will continue. Uh, as we have indicated, the model is typically as we work on other dedicated projects, where typically it's it's a cost plus uh, pricing model uh, uh, that we employ. Uh, as for the remaining 50 percent, as as we had indicated earlier, and as Anish also mentioned in uh, in reference to one of the earlier questions. Uh, as we get the plant, our initial focus would be to ensure that we ramp up the production wherein we can supply the full quantity to this customer. And we will also utilize that time to get ourselves qualified with other customers. And then as we get become more comfortable in further ramping up the volume, we will start this, having these conversations with other customers to supply to them also. At the same time, we are having conversations with other customers to potentially get into uh, some long-term contracts for the future years uh, with them. But that will happen gradually. 
you know, because what we don't want is suddenly to have all these customers uh, engaging with all the customers for 2024 supply and then positioning us for pay years. So it will happen progressively. Yeah. So, Meet, if I may add, the structure of these contracts is typically a take or pay, and then each year you start getting firmer purchase orders. I mean, the fact that we have now got a purchase order for next year is actually pretty solid, you know, in that sense. Sure. And uh, the second thing we had mentioned in our presentation was that, uh, that this, uh, uh, you know, plant was more for a building block kind of molecule. So how do we see the derivatives uh, moving there? Or have you plants around that side? Sorry, uh, we didn't, yeah, what, what was your question? What was the, I and mean, we didn't get the start of the question. Sorry, so um, am I clear now? Yeah, yeah. So we had mentioned in our presentation that this plant is more for a building block kind of a molecule. So, you know, we might be having plans to move into derivatives going forward. So any thoughts around that or is it too premature at this point of time? Premature. No, this is an important building block. We will be supplying this molecule to the customer. We also will be utilizing the product ourselves to do some downstream derivatives. Even today, we manufacture and sell a downstream derivative of this uh, to one customer. With this, we will actually be hopefully be able to backward integrate and improve the overall profitability by doing that. And there are certain other opportunities that we have identified by which then we will be able to move downstream and do those downstream derivatives as well. So all the three possibilities exist. So, and uh, so lastly, on the new five products that we are planning to launch, uh, two from Surat, uh, sorry, two from Dahej and three from Surat. So all these five molecules will be mapped in the multipurpose plant itself. So in, in the Dahej NTP, going forward, we'll be doing six molecules instead of five. Is the understanding correct? No, so I think we, uh, as these molecules ramp up, we will look for opportunities for some of them to be mapped in NTP in Surat, some of them to be mapped in NTP in Dahej, and as these molecules ramp up, there is a possibility that we might require, depending on the customer requirement, possibly even a dedicated plan for some of these. But we currently have multiple NTP options. The hedge is not the only option available to us. So it will be the hedge plus Surat. Sure. Understood, sir. Thanks for that. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mr. Ranjit from IIFL Securities. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, sir. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, so in the opening comment, you did uh, said that the HF plant is uh, largely on track. So just wanted to hear some comments. How do you, uh, we plan to utilize it captively probably over the next three to four years? And what kind of a project we are looking at to kind of consume the HF internally? And second, uh, just an extension to that, uh, how should one see that debt panning out over the next couple of years? We are at around 1200 or close of cross debt. Uh, how should one see that? Okay, so let me take the gross debt question first. I mean, uh, gross debt, and I mean, I've, I've said this before, we normally don't give forecasts out on, on debt, etc. I mean, our focus always has been to take projects and progress them within a solid financial framework, which we agree with the board which covered, amongst other things, debt, return, commercial, de-risking, et cetera, yeah? So, unfortunately, I won't give the guidance on debt um, going in the future, but uh, um, it, it is what it is at the moment, and you just have to, um, you know, look at it as we bring projects for approval and share with you as to where the profile of the company is and the balance sheet and the strength within the balance sheet. Okay. Um, your, uh, uh, on the HF, uh, I think our commentary remains same as what we had made when we announced the CapEx. We're looking at three sets of opportunities. One, uh, where we will actually use some of that HF for our own use in existing three projects as those projects scale up, uh, you know, including the current HPP project and the new CapEx, which uh, will get commissioned next year, uh, et cetera. There are some new uh, opportunities that we are looking at beyond these three uh, business units, and we are working to develop those opportunities. So that will be the second set of outlets. And the third 
uh, given our current constraint on HF, we have significantly reduced our merchant sales of HF. So there also we are actually continue, continuously seeing very good opportunities. So the third set of opportunity will be there to increase the merchant sale of HF. So one will be HF for our existing 3BU, then HF for our new opportunities beyond the 3BU, and then for merchant sale. Good. Thanks uh, for answering that. Uh, one bookkeeping question, uh, uh, largely to Anish. Uh, we have seen a dip in the employee cost. Uh, is this sustainable on an absolute run rate? 